So Joyce, I wanted to start uh, with a very simple question, which is, um, you know, we're here at the American Craft Council, and I want you to tell me what craftsmanship means to you in your own practice. I was just called a Baltimore-based artist, but I'm actually a Baltimorean. I'm an artist who's lived here my entire life, whose parents are from North and South Carolina, cotton pickers and tobacco pickers. I come from many, many generations of craftspeople. So if I had to talk about, and, and I will talk about what craftsmanship is for me, it, it really is a first person relationship with your, your materials. Well, all artists will tell you if they're lucky that that's a first person relationship with their materials. But even though we use tools, it is the continuation of a historical form of making artwork. And it also can be very gender or ethnicity based as well. Scared you, didn't I? A little bit. Yeah, because I wasn't like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> So um, one of the things that you can see on the slides that we're playing behind us is that Joyce has worked in many, many media, from printmaking to performance. In fact, I'm surprised she hasn't sung to you already. They sat down we've, too fast. We've been at this for five minutes, and I'll usually a song will have come out by now. i get them. <laughs> But to beads, to working with glass, to working with a multiple multiplicity of media. So what I want to know is, how do you decide which medium you're going to use for the message that you want to impart in the pieces that you're making? She's such an egghead. You see how? You just, you see, how do you decide <laughs> which mediums you use? See, she went to college. Well, I've been blessed, you know. I went to undergraduate school and I really thought I was going to be a painter and my, one of my painting teachers told me I should stop painting for my own personal growth and the betterment of the entire human race. He actually said that to me. Of course, I told him that years later at one of my openings and he, he lied. I never said, yes, he did. When I say that I come from many generations of artists and craftspeople, my mother, Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott, is a nationally, it was a nationally known textile artist, and I started making artwork with her. And she taught me many things. Then when I went to undergraduate school and they said, stop painting, I decided to uh, go into teaching, education. And when you are studying education, then you have to learn all kinds of things, you know. You have to learn how to do something in clay, and you have to teach them how to draw, and you have to know textiles. And that directly worked with my, my mother taught me many years ago. I realized during student teaching, if I became a teacher in the public school system, that I would be a 700-pound alcoholic. So, you guys can laugh at that. There are obviously teachers here. How dare she? <laughs> so, I went to Mexico like any self-respecting hippie, and I kept studying different things. Now, that's a precursor to that question, because I am from the South, so it takes me a very long time to answer questions. I've been blessed with learning many different skills. So, instead of choosing something, I work on multiple forms at once. I can consistently ask a piece of artwork to do something and it keeps saying, no, I'm unable to, I will not. So I work on a variety of pieces of one, uh, so I can ask it to do something and it will yield to me. And I, I choose by whatever kind of conversation I'm having with the artwork. You know what I mean? I might be doing something about race or sex or something about beauty. And so I choose the materials and the form in direct regard to that. I had the opportunity to um, introduce Joyce in 2010, I guess it was, for the Women's Caucus for the Arts Award, which is presented around the same time as the College Art Association Conference. And it was the first, first mother-daughter team yes. that had ever won those awards, because her um, recent ancestor, Mother Scott, and Joyce were the first mother and daughter team to have won those. And um, one of the things that I remember about your mother and that I know to be true of you uh. is that I think of you both as being griots, that is storytellers that hold something of our culture in your storytelling. And you have this ability to preserve 
our history and our ancestry through story, through song, through media, and all of those really wonderful things that make up Joyce, like wordplay and artifacts, using artifacts in the work, all of those kinds of things. And I'm wondering, since there's always this thread of narrative in the work, you might disagree with me about mm. that, but I think that there's always a thread of narrative in the work. I'm wondering if the story comes first, if the character comes first and makes the work for you, or if as you're making the work, the character emerges. Some writers think about those two things happening either way. Hey, everybody, your <laughs> Scott's in town. I got three dollars and I'm ready to clown. So don't let anybody play you cheap. I got 50 cents more than I'm gonna keep. So let the good times roll. That's what I do in the studio. I let the good times roll. Thank you very much. Have you guys been drinking? Because this is the applause I'm getting. <laughs> well, then bring me one, because you guys have to wake up. If I'm here, then you have to, you know. I wore velvet. Come on. I let the good times roll in the studio. I don't know if you've noticed this. I seem to have a large and buoyant ego. And for me, it's, it's important to try to rest as much of that at the door of my studio and go in and really have a relationship with whatever I'm doing while I'm there. So sometimes the story's first. Mm -hmm. I, I seem to like a lot just being able to go into the studio and make things. If the first thing is really very, very um, successful, then I might make a series of things, and that's like chapters in a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm just in there just working. And, and if I could give that to you, it is the ability to go into the studio and be confounded and joyous and all of that stuff when you're in there. I, I haven't locked myself in a scheme of making artwork or all of my artwork would look exactly the same. And that's not the quest I'm on. Right. And it doesn't all look the same, but no. it does have the soul of Joyce in it. Yes, which is frightening, but yes. <laughs> you know, but, but it's frightening because... Submission, and I'm not talking about S&M. Three people don't run out of the room or people don't wave your hands like me. <laughs> when I talk about submission, being an artist is something very special. I know everyone believes they're special and no one ever now, when they, when, when they have a contest, everybody gets a gold star, even if you're last and did the worst job possible. But being able to create from yourself not being told what to do by others, to spend your time making artwork that's not only important to you, but to others, this is special. And so to be working toward the force means submission to me. It really means that I must try to be honorable and gracious to these wonderful gifts that I've been given and don't worry, I'm not going to, well, I might do an old Negro spiritual now. Hmm. It's all ahead, about, ahead, about ahead, everybody loves Negro spiritual. Oh, yes, a Negro spiritual. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what I'm a, I, my real point is that I honestly am one of those people who can avidly say I am standing on the shoulders of some people. I mean, you know, we, like, that's like the 60s and the 70s, and it's, uh, you know, marching talk, and we don't like to say that anymore, you know. But I, I am the real product of, of sharecroppers and folks who didn't have any money and no real academic schooling, and they worked hard to make me who I am, you know? Okay, I think I went very far away from the question. No, you, you okay. answered the question. Okay. Um, so speaking, uh, speaking about the people that brought you to us. Yes. All of those, all of those fine answer, ancestors that... She said financiers, you heard it. <laughs> we wish, right? Yeah. Um, fine ancestors that uh, compose the DNA that is you. There's something that they have about coming from simple means and using whatever is available to them to make what is necessary, to make what is art, to come from those humble means to innovate, 
And that's one of the things that I see in you, deeply rooted in you, is this fearless innovation with this strong recognition of one's ancestry and where you come from. There's also this art of improvisation, mm. which just comes out of your pores. You just can't help it. I've tried to help you with What's this problem. What are talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and so can you talk to us a little bit about how you use improvisation yeah, sure. in your work? Well, firstly, I'm going to walk right by her calling my family simple. Did you use it? <laughs> and just simpletons in your family, such simple people, humbly simpleton native people. <laughs> I'm an African-American who loves being an African-American. Whatever you are, I think is cool. I'm an African-American. And that means that I come from a long line of everybody. Yeah, we're Native Americans, we're Africans, I'm part Scottish, maybe a little French. And imbued, embodied in all of that in this American experience is not only the way you think, but the music that I hear. When you ever hear an Irish guy sing the blues, then you know that it's maybe a different color blue, but the blues is an international universal thing. When, I, when I'm thinking a lot of ancestors, and I don't want to sound just a little bit too metaphysical or drug addicted, they're telling me that it's all right to be me and it's all right to use this font, this enormous well uh, of life that they've given me. So I, I'm cool about it. Now, improvisation is one of those things where, for many performers, it's like this. Everybody has boundaries and walls in a civil society that we use to be polite and eager to please others. I have some of those. <laughs> improvisation allows you to be less concerned about propriety and the reasons, I'm not wishing to be impolite, but the knowledge that progress means change. Frederick Douglass said, agitate, agitate, agitate. And if my best voice is as an artist, and I think it is, and, and I didn't, I wasn't born in an art house, I was born with art parents, and I didn't eat art soup and went to an art school, I did go to an art school, and I did wear art, I can't, I'm gonna like mess up my own argument now. But I didn't live in the art world, in the art state, and take an art bus to school. I have the same desires and the same issues about life that you do, so I can use them in what I do. Why do I improvise? Because you are not the boss of me. <laughs> I mean, I've had to think about this a lot. And why is that important? Because in a world that's being more and more throttled by uniformity. Now, I know how that is. How can you say that when everybody's on the cell tweeting? Tweeting is a form of uniformity. How can you say that when we're all everybody from around the world is on the computer? A form of uniformity. It's all right to be someone who can step out of that box. And that am me. And let me, I'm going to go right back to, and this, I really believe, comes from me as a jazz singer, as a scatterski. That impulse to push as hard as you can against the wall, move through it, find another wall, move through that, drag somebody with you, have a martini and have a good time, help to change the world. It's this improvisational impulse for me. And it's one of the great things that artists have because we're always pushing against, even those people who are the most conservative artists in some way, every time they impasse or they lay down that brush stroke, is something unique and of them. I did a C, that was a C. That was a C, guys. I don't understand this clapping. I don't she wants more clapping. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll speak to you later. <laughs> if it's not evident to you, Joyce is a comedian. And she can't help that either. No, I can't. 
Um, but one of the things that I find remarkable about Joyce is that she uses humor in a way that connects us all. But she, she wraps humor and often uses stereotypes, the things that we think about one another, together. So stereotypes could be something that we think of as being the opposite of humor, the opposite of what would make us join together. That's the stuff that we don't really know about each other, but we think we know about each other, but is often based on a little bit of fact, you know, not the whole picture, but a piece of a picture. You often use that coupled with humor, exactly. which is sort of this involuntary thing. You know, you laugh, you don't think, oh, that's funny. You just laugh involuntarily. So I want you to talk a little bit about how you use humor and stereotype to speak to your audience. Well, it's very important to me because, you know, <laughs> stereotypes generally are based on some kind of truth or something that we've seen and, you know, skewed in some form. I would like you to think about the Shrek movie, right? Well, nobody really knows a troll. I mean, I, we all dated one, but I mean, an actual <laughs> troll, nobody even knows one, right? So we, you can be a troll anything. But when I watch Eddie Murphy as that donkey, that's a Uncle Remus, Tar Baby, Pig Meat Markham, historic black comedian that's stereotypical from the 30s and the 40s that was deemed Amos and Andy and negative in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Yet we cannot stop laughing at that donkey. And every time he's jumping around doing those things, you have to also remember who he is. He is a legba, he is the trickster, he is the guardian of the gate, he is the wisdom. So you know he's trying to get Shrek to stop doing troll stuff. You can't depend upon that cat. The cat's always licking himself and doing the eye thing. You cannot control it. Who's the one who's like, we better go this way. No, don't do that trick. Who's the one that's like giving the eyeball to these very strange cookies? And It's the donkey. That's all very stereotypically constructed to do what it does to us. And he's very successful with it. I like that. I like that we all have this big repository of stuff that's positive and negative within us. And if you can just keep messing with the stuff that we think is negative, because no matter what you say, everybody has a fat, black, gappy tooth, nappy haired, it's a wig, big titted, big butted woman, auntie like me in the house who you only allow to come by for Christmas or Thanksgiving, <laughs> not both. They are a cesspool, a repository, or all that stuff about your family history or what, whatever, your ethnic history. You know, African American this, in, in this country, we're always, we've had such a dense and deep history in this culture that, and, uh, you know, this is the way I'm thinking about this one. Like black people, because African Americans right now is taking a little longer to say. <laughs> we must be much more powerful than we know that we are because we are less than 13% of the population. Now, if you think about the clothing that you're wearing, the music that you're listening to, the types of foods you eat, and the unique hairstyles and lip colors, it's because of many black people swaying, or in some senses, music you're listening to controlling the pop culture. Now, how can we be these people and be the only drug addicts, the only people on welfare, and the only people in jail. We must be some powerful people. So if that's true, I'm always messing with that stereotype. But I also think, well, if it's that bad for me or that strange for me, what must it be for many Hispanic folks who are here trying to live in that? I mean, all the stuff that we do, because humans have a penchant, that's a French thing, I know you guys know. <laughs> They have a pingent, as my mom would say, to just do dopey things to each other. And how do we get beyond that? Or if not get beyond it, how do we like, you know, stay in that soup and play with it? It's through this kind of messing with stereotypes, messing with the images that we are comfortable or uncomfortable with, and just messing with it. You gotta mess with stuff. You, uh, complacency is a very hard thing for me. And I know that because I, I, I sit on the couch like, and I know that that is not a progressive thing. And I think we should stop having children. 
until we get it right and start working about changing the world, we should, so why are we going to do that to them? So my thing is like, let's work on it. And I do it with my best voice, which is through this comedy and through stereotypes. And you know what? Laughing like singing is a very special way of breathing. You're completely off guard. Somebody has said something to you that's funny. I used to do a performance with a group we were called Honey Child Milk, and we did coon shows. But nobody knew it was a coon show until we get to, it was a musical. We get to the very end and I'd say to my daughter, after she was like, and I'm leaving. No, she had a low voice, and I'm leaving, and I'm then, you know, and then I'd say to her, I hope I live to see you again. See you again in Coonsville. And the people in the audience were like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody, did she say Coon? It's like that the German Coon, K O O N, or is that the Negroes, you know, slavery, oh my God, Coon? And at that moment, we had them. They laugh. Oh my God, coons! He never coons, y'all. <laughs> well, that, that's that's the thing that I'm always intrigued about with you is that, you know, we're looking at some of this work behind us that is dealing with really difficult issues. You know, there's issues of um, rape, issues of stereotype, issues of the way that humans are not good to each other, and then you're using a medium that is really seductive. You know, and what's interesting to me is that they are a complete embodiment of you, right? Because Joyce is a seductress. Any man in this room who has known Joyce before, <laughs> he's looking at me he's like this. Absolutely. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get close to them. No. I think they heard what I said. <laughs> I just, I we'll just, talk later, you know, good son. I just want to make sure it gets on tape. That's what it is. So Joyce is a seductress, but not only in who she is as a human being and how she walks through this earth, but also in the artwork itself, that you're using seductive materials. We know that one of the problems in glass medium or even in, in beads is that they're so beautiful. Then how do you get past the beauty to get to content, right? And you always manage to find a way to get to content because the content is difficult content yeah. often. So can you talk, just talk about that a little bit? Well, to me, I, I'm an artist who went to art school. I, as I said, I studied with my mom when she was, when I was a little baby, I had the best dressed dolls in my neighborhood. I tell everyone that I was an artist in vitro. When I came out, I had a placenta that I'd drawn on and it was just really beautiful. <laughs> And I tell everybody I was a comedian, Vitro. When I came out of my mom, I'm like this. Whew. I had a hard time getting out of the vagina. <laughs> Any of you nurses from out of town? <laughs> I want you to look at my artwork and go, oh, what is that shimmering, most beautifully crafted thing, that sculptural piece that defies the Rothko and the Picasso that I'm walking by to see? I want you to luxuriate in the beauty because I believe that I must be a good artist first. No matter what my message is, I must make the artwork that, that grabs you and keeps you involved. And once you're there, eyes locked, you realize that it's a small woman who's bleeding vaginally and if you read the label, it calls day after rape. And it's about women who are the fodder of war. Women who might be walking to get water from a camp. And a guy on a camel in Darfur rides up to her, rapes her. He might kill her and make her body a different shape and put her head on her butt. I mean, the way that humans are so weird. And he made a piece of sculpture. He may see that as beauty. It's a big circle, you see. So what I'm saying to you is I am an artist first. The, the concept or the message should never subsume or consume my ability to create good art. 
you know, and everybody has their idea about good art, but I can tell you my art is good art, whatever anybody else thinks about other people's art. When do you know that you're done with a piece? Uh, when it doesn't sell, no. <laughs> Well, I really sometimes am not. I really may have something in a gallery and get it back and realize that I hadn't told the story properly or it wasn't good, and so I'll cut it up and, and reshape it. Um, I think when, I, when, the, when the artwork says stop, you know, really, when there's nothing else I can add and I've taken off everything, but if it isn't the end of the story, that's when I start doing... Um, series because that first one was just the first page of whatever kind of chapter I'm writing about this work. So it's it's clear that you're willing to go into a lot of topics that most people wouldn't venture into. Mm. But is there any topic that is taboo? Anything that you have found yourself shirking away from? Me? Oh, there's now certain you have things to get on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's certain things about myself that I do not wish to reveal until all the people who are involved are dead. <laughs> and I'm not joking about that. Uh, there are certain pieces of art that I've been doing but won't show until everybody's dead or it has a uh, felonious name on it about who did this or that to me until their parents and everybody is dead. And I don't know if I'll ever show that work. But I, I try to think about issues and... I don't know why, how you could not talk. In, in this series somewhere, you've seen a, a pink face and a pink penis. That is my... Um, oh, I was going to get to that. My, albi mm -hmm. my flayed albino. And, and in parts of Africa, African albinos are living in their neighborhood. They're coming home from work. And someone waylays them and cuts their arms off and then throws them on the ground. Your neighbor will come into your house and take your albino, no baby, and, and steal it and cut it up because they see these human beings, these people who are their cousins, their neighbors, the folks who look exactly like them except for skin tone, hair and eye color, as some kind of exotic something that can be used. Well, if you're talking about human beings having lost everything, and this is just Africa, it happens many other places, I thought, how will I talk about that? So I, I just had to make artwork on it. Sometimes I'll do issues about the sexual objectification of men. Well, maybe I'm not a man, so there's all kinds of stuff that I, I may not exactly know a man's feeling, but I'm a human, and men are just other humans, and I think pain doesn't have a, a gender, so I ought to be able to talk about that too. And if pain is truly this universal thing, if he's feeling it, I got to be feeling something. So I ought to be able to talk about it. I don't know. I, I really don't know what I would not talk about except me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, um... Wait, and let me say, I've used myself a lot in my work. And that is what performance is, me. But I mean, there are specific issues that I probably wouldn't talk about. So I'm also curious, because you've been so prolific, if there's a... Shut up! <laughs> yes. If there's, a, if there's a piece of work that you've made that you think is particularly successful. You mean not all of my work? You mean like not every, particularly totally successful. each and every piece? They're all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your favorite child? I don't have it. I, I don't have favorite kids. Maybe the things that are in many ways most successful are the things that make me very happy that I'm an artist. At 63, I really did start doing art at around three years old with my mom. Someone who's been doing artwork for that long, if I could give you something, I'd rather sell it to you in the bottle, but you know, I'm being like, um, let the sun shine, kumbaya. <laughs> if I could give you something, it would be the ability to be completely in love with what you do. I, I am the right person for this job. And the ability to be in the studio and make artwork that shakes your boots. That you've done this beadwork already four billion times. I'm working on, I showed her yesterday, I'm working on an Obama bust because there's a show called 44 and they sent out these white 
life-size bust of Obama. And later on, I realized it was like the Maryland crab or the, or in Chicago was the bull and they'll probably auction it off. Well, he had on this tie that had stripes in it. And I made chevron stripes and a netted thing. It was fabulous. And I did this. I made Obama's tie like, oh my God. To be, to be tingling about your ability, to know that all that time you spent in making something is alive in what you do, and it's still alive. You can still, you know, uh, have a, uh, I'm trying so much not to cuss and not <laughs> using sexual illusions. You're doing very well. But that you, you know that you still are like this. <laughs> so like happily in the genitalia area because of what just happened to you. You know, you're like hot from the experience. That's what I want artists and others, whatever your job is, to have it throughout your life. This is amazing. Yeah, and so when you lucky. watch kids and you're attempting to teach, and remember I'm the 700 pound alcoholic, so I don't teach kids a lot. And you watch them being so full of this experience of life, and then you get them in, in junior high school and you know, I'm in, uh, <laughs> you wanna take them back and shake them so that they'll, they'll just, they'll just see the joy of life. And that really is what this is for me. It's, it's making me want to stay alive with this, this great, my ability and I am blessed. You know, I wanted to say this also, cause you, you called me a temptress or a seductress earlier, seductress. I called you lots of names. You did. I think I called you that. And yes. I'm all of those things. <laughs> but if I would think of myself as someone, it would be the Alegba person that I talked about you, who is like maybe an Orisha or Nigerian saint, and he is the trickster. His job really is to Agitate. keep the mix yeah. going. He is Frederick Douglass. He is uh, right now Obama or Trump, Donald Trump, but he's in the no-no trickster bag because I, I think he's crazy, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but the whole thing is the trickster's job is through comedy. The trickster is the jester. To be able to say things, see, I, I don't plan to say them. They just, that's the improvisational thing. They just jump out of my mouth. But to be able to be one of the people in the world who says, you know, this gyroscope is moving around and we have to jump on it. You have to be present for it. And, and that's who I want to be. I'm just fabulous. That, that's natural. But the trickster <laughs> is something I have to work on. I said that and there were people looking at me like this. I'll speak to all of you later. <laughs> this group especially over here. Yes, darling. What time is it? 4.45? No, just no, joking. No, we have, you know, we have plenty of time. Okay, what else do you want to know? Don't ask me my weight. <laughs> and, uh, okay, what? I am. Um, These I are real, Mr. I, Mr. I would not like to touch you ever. <laughs> real. No. You just, you and I later. <laughs> is that no. yes or no God? Is that yes God or no God? No. I met oh, wait, let's talk about that. That was just a... Do you realize within my lifetime, within many people's lifetime, I would never have been able to get, to get away with saying to a white boy, he's waving like, you can do it with me anytime. I know, darling. <laughs> and you and I, you know. <laughs> no, but quite, think about how the world has spun. It just wouldn't, have, you know, we wouldn't have done it in public. <laughs> On the plantation somewhere. But, but you know what I mean? So, but that comes from people agitating all the time, saying, why is that funny? Why can't yeah. that work? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the thing, Joyce, I was trying to remember that when we met, I think it might have been 1992. She was in diapers. I don't even know why she's saying that. And you better wake up. I see you good looking. <laughs> you know I will call people out in the audience. Because I know how funny I am. And he went to sleep. Yeah. Yes, Sonia, because he's going to beat me up later. So, yes, Sonia. <laughs> I'm waiting. Can you tell them to shut up again? Shut up! <laughs> area in the 1300 and 1400 
Now, this the, guy is the whole boss of, of, of the American Craft Council, and he's looking at me like, I'm not paying her. <laughs> I'm not going to pay her. Very not going to do it. Okay, I'm not going to wait for them. Okay. When we met in 1992, I remember you telling this story to a bunch of artists. We were students at the Art Institute of Chicago. It was some conference or something, and you were talking about the thing that was most precious to you. Do I don't you remember- think I can say that. Can you I can't. say that? This make- I, no. No, no, no. Okay, I don't think so. Imagine a portion of one's body if one was... The golden triangle. (laughs) That was most precious, right. And half the people in the audience had their jaws dropping to the ground. The other half were laughing. And all of us were just stunned at your ability to say the things that nobody else would say. I met you in 1992. I still am stunned at your ability... (laughs) To say the things that no one else will say. Joyce and I will go out to dinner or spend time together, and I think, I'm sorry for this wait, waiter or waitress who was helping us, because she's just going to tease them endlessly throughout this meal. And we get everything we want. And she gets everything she wants <laughs> at because the same mine. time. <laughs> Let me tell that story, but I yeah. can't say the words, because there's a lot of cussing. This started... <laughs> The first time it started was I was doing crits at the Chicago Art Institute or Institute of Art. What is the Art, in, Art, the Art Institute, Institute of Chicago? With graduate students, and there was this young woman who said, "You don't remember me, do you?" I went to Micah to the Maryland Institute College of Art, and I'd been raped, and you helped me make artwork and you helped me do things. And she said, "I'm I'm stumbling again," and she was having problems making baby steps. I mean, they were little, so I said, "You know what?" You should just jump into it. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? This, this is not going to drop off in the street. And she was like this. So then I went through a whole story about what happens if it drops off. Because what we do in our lives sometimes is have the most wonderful thing, but we don't treasure it. We don't work on it. We don't nurture it. So suppose it dropped off in the street. You're the type of person who would be standing there looking at it, embarrassed, knowing that it's yours and a real important part of your psyche and your actual body, and instead of scooping it up because you're afraid of those steps, you'd just be, you know, hitting it with the foot. And people would come around and yell at it. And So just when you got up the courage, because it can be too late, folks, just when you were going down to pick up your golden, a dog comes and grabs it and runs off with it. <laughs> So you're watching the thing that you have the responsibility for. That is yours. Go away. And you can see him on the, co- on the horizon running off. And so you go to the policeman and you, you make a missing golden triangle report. <laughs> oh, I go through all these things and you're at home and on the milk carton they have a picture of it and the name and everything. It's all about the fear about not not grabbing what is yours, being in control of it, and being the you about it. And she said, oh, okay. Now, I would tell that story during stand-up. Whole audience, men and women, I'd use all the actual words. The men and women, they're laughing. It's all very funny. I went to graduate, did a graduate something somewhere. It was not with you. It was with a clique of little, this is the true, older white women who were in a graduate department somewhere in the Midwest. I don't know where. It's been so long. And I just told this story because we're all women and we're feminists and we're all, and they were like this. <laughs> I mean, but they, no one, no one in the group was not doing this. And I, I, I mean, they really didn't know how to talk to me or anything after that. I'm saying, but wait a second. You get the empowerment story I'm trying to, no. You just talked about her coochies out loud and no. <laughs> <laughs> what? There's a method to my madness, folks. There is always a method to your madness. And I am mad. Yeah. <laughs> I've been saying for years that Joyce is missing that part of your brain that says, "Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that out loud." <laughs> More than once. And she always says it. She always says what we're thinking. We shouldn't say. You always say it. And you know the thing is, if I was missing that part of my brain, I wouldn't have friends. <laughs> and I really don't say everything that I'm thinking. Which is really scary. Because it would be like, oh no, she didn't. And I walk out of the house like that. No. 
Somebody talk to that girl about her hair. Hey, mister, are you pregnant? I mean, I would do all horrible things. So if I were that kind of drunk, I'd be great, though. But I'd be dead. See, I'm convinced you actually do say most of what comes Most, your but mind. not all. You yeah. said everything. But the only thing that you hold back is what might fall into the place of cruelty. Yeah. It's never about cruelty. Well, it's always cruel about honesty, right? It's always about honesty. My idea of honesty. Because, you know, everybody has their own idea of honesty. <laughs> And that's the truth about the visual work I do. This is my idea. Just because I look, just because I want to stop racism doesn't mean everybody else does. I have to stand up for me. It's my voice. I have to want to be friends with you. You may say no after that crack joy, no. You might just do that. But my job is to be real with me and to stand up for what I believe is right and also for those around that either have protected me or I have to try to help protect meaning kids and elders and, and others who don't have the wherewithal to do what I do. So, but cruelty is not a thing that you have to do. Many people do it, and they're very funny, but you don't have to do it. Well, what I find really interesting about the work is that often you are dealing with issues of cruelty very, very, because yeah. it's like you don't understand them. And so the work is a way of trying to figure out why we are cruel to each other and asking these questions like, yeah. How do we as human beings come to do this to one another? Because I don't think it comes naturally to you. I've known you for a long time, and I've never known you to be cruel. I've known no, you to be a drunk. Cruel <laughs> did you actually say that? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. I have been. I've been, like, fabulously drunk. And when I get drunk, I get amorous. So this is me amorous. <laughs> So anybody who would take me home if I'm like this, <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't be with them. <laughs> but really, that's what I think I am. And I, I also think I'm the, the funniest person in the world. So I just might repeat that joke five or six times. <laughs> long after you laughed at it or have not, I'd probably still be there working you. And, and you do that. You work out bits with your friends all the time. Last night, we were doing this. You were just, I have this little bit. And, and you're working out your jokes with your friends. Well, some of it I can't do because I'm working with Kayla Wall. For years, we performed this at Thunder Thigh Review, and we're going to do a reunion this year together. And she's now a Muslim woman. So it might be the, my responsibility to do all the other stuff. And, and I'm working out a whole thing about on stage about not having a lover for a long time. And, and when he comes to me, this is what he would do. Ah, and bats would fly out. <laughs> so I'm working on that, and I'm saying this at the dinner table, and they're like, stop. Don't do that. All the other tables were also going, stop. Don't, don't, don't do don't that. Do <laughs> I did Dra Dracula coming out. I want to fuck something else. <laughs> you know, you have to put on a, a miner's cap with a light and a canary to go down there. And so I'm doing all these jokes, and then the, the, the stop. And then we were talking about her. You see how svelte and thin she is? So we're talking about her. And I was talking about, you have fat, but it's so, such a rare thing with you. It must be like gold in cellulite. And so she's like one of those goddesses who has like four drops of cellulite that, that you can use to heal with. We can hey, we'll heal with her fat. It's a wonderful kind of fat that we can heal with and she's like this don't do that and you I take believe I made that request not to do that today <laughs> then I thought like yeah but that's like three drops of fat that's not a whole show so I was thinking about suppose I'm the one with the gold and cellulite this is like an hour's work I can make so many bits off of that so as I'm saying this at dinner they really are like stop and I'm like wait what do you think about <laughs> We both encourage and discourage simultaneously. I don't listen to the discourage. <laughs> They're not the boss of me. That is clear. That is clear. Are you mad at me? Good. I did a little thing on him, and he's been looking at me like I'm going to blacken this on. <laughs> oh, and you should be. <laughs> and you should have done something about that before you did. There you go. <laughs> Solidarity. Yes. So, you know, you have had a, a lot of success. Everybody, Joy Scott is a household name, in my <laughs> household, at least. Like Clorox or something. <laughs> it's a household name. And I know there have been things that you've done in your work. We were talking about this last night, that there are certain bodies of work that you've made that have met with a lot of success, and people 
collectors, galleries want that work over and over and over again. And I want you to talk a little bit about the fearlessness that it takes to not get caught in that trap. I could have been uh, very rich from making mammies and black penises. I did a series called Nanny Now, Nigger Later. My mother told me that the most hurtful thing for her was to raise a white child, be everything except a wet nurse. And when it was old enough, it would call her a nigger. Now, wait a second. This baby didn't maybe even know what that means. But she's working in the house with people who's teaching her that. Okay. So I did a series on that. It's very successful. I could have made nannies and mammies, because they're beautifully made forever. But it's like, no, I don't want to be like the mammy woman. Then I made a, a series on the sexual, the sexual objectification of black men specifically, because you know the whole thing about it's always bigger and they don't go to school, but boy, can they, all the stuff. I could have sold so many beautifully crafted penises. I'm like, no. <laughs> Because after you do the third one, then people aren't buying it because they understand the message. They want to have one in their house. And so the idea is to step away from the stuff that has lost its meaning or that means something different to others. Because I know that I've even heard from folks that they were going to buy my work to either destroy it or to put it somewhere so that they could talk about it being nigger work. So then I like, well, I'm going to have to step off this because this is something that others are going to use in the exact opposite of the reason that I created it. Plus, you know, I just have too many ideas right. to not step away from that kind of thing. I, I'm going to stay on the subject of beadwork just for a little bit because I'm, I'm always thinking about what it means to use beads. It's one of the things that we have in common, a, me a medium that we both use sometimes. You use it a lot more. It's but. my husband leaving. <laughs> Thanks, love. And he just hit his butt. I don't know what that means. Later. Later for you. Okay. Later or, or kiss. I don't know what the hell people's husbands do. <laughs> but I'm always thinking about the idea of beads as being a very durable medium and your glasswork as being a very durable media that will outlive us all. So I'm wondering if you could fast forward 2,000 years from now, what do you think people will, let's say they unearth some Joyce Scott work? How do you think they'll read it in, in a different context? I hope they look at this stuff and go, wow, were they screwed up and aren't we glad we're not here? Mm -hmm. I really hope they're gonna look at something about racism and go, thank God we're not doing this anymore. What must they, look who we came from. I really think, because we do that about Egyptians and Greeks and stuff. You know, we look at all the wonderful kinds of mosaics and the gladiators. I watch Spartacus because my husband, Manu Bennett, is in Spartacus. I know he, he, when he goes to bed at night, he has my name on his lips. But him and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, another Pacific Rim, both of them like this, Joyce, where are you? <laughs> We look back at history and we see the stuff that we really evolved from and the things that we really love and laud. And I hope they, they see that I'm talking about a, a really uncomfortable time in many ways. A wonderful time in many ways, but a very, very uncomfortable time. And I hope they go like, wow, I'm glad we're not doing that. Look where we are. I hope they're not like still, still doing horrible things to each other. But see, you say you don't... I think that's... I think that's humanity. Mm. I, when people say it's inhuman, like you don't see squids doing that or bumblebees doing that. That's humans doing it to humans. So I think we have a very long way to go on the evolutionary scale. There, I don't know how many people there are in the audience. Those are my grandparents, my father's side of the family. We decided to make sure that Joyce's ancestors were here with us too so there are pictures of you're her you're not the boss of me <laughs> say whatever I want <laughs> grandparents and these quilts that are behind us those are my father's mother's quilts Mamie uh, Mamie Scott yes Mamie Scott 
So Joyce, I, uh, this is this might be my last question for okay. you. Okay. Um, there are many, many makers who are here at ACC. I'm and very honored to be here with them. And you've been able to be a maker and an artist and a singer and a seductress, I'll call you that, every yes. opportunity that I get. Thank you very much. <laughs> She's trying to get me a husband. <laughs> Married with children, that one. <laughs> I'm only messing with him because I know you know him. So I won't be assaulted when we leave the room. Yes. <laughs> what what advice do you have oh. for people who want to be full-time artists? Cuz you composed a life around your art practice. The advice question. Yeah, the advice question. Well, it's very difficult because quite honestly, I'm I'm old enough to be able to say that I see the change in the world. When I left school, I didn't have any loans to pay off. There there are now like, you know, federal investigations on how a person could have $900 worth of student loans but only make $800 a month. And how people are becoming homeless from trying to pay off their school bills. Okay, so how do I tell someone to make the grand tour when they are stopping not having, when they're waiting to have children or to buy property because they're paying off their student loans. So my advice is to keep making artwork. You know, whatever you do, just keep making artwork. If it's like two hours a night or all weeking, just keep making art. Be alive with your artwork and things can come for you. This is economically a very difficult time to sell art and to make art. But, but most of the artists that I know are making artwork not only because it is their profession, but because it feeds something so special in you that you, you don't want to lose that. And it is easy to lose unless you go after it. So just keep that muscle going. Shall I sing this song to end us? You should definitely sing a song to end us. Thanks. I usually open the, this with this, and it's an homage to my mom and dad and to those who who made art before me. I'm not scared of dying and I don't really care. If it's peace you find in dying, well then, let my time be near. If it's peace you find in dying, and if dying time is near, then bundle up my coffin cause it's cold way down there. Troubles are many, they're as deep as a well. I can say there ain't no heaven, and I'll pray there ain't no hell. I can say there ain't no heaven, and I'll pray there ain't no hell. But I'll never know by living, only by dying will tell. And when I die, and when I'm gone, there'll be one child born. There'll be one child born left. There'll be one child born to carry on. Sonia Clark. Thank you very much. And the fabulous Joyce.